calling the February meeting of the AMSA Board of Trustees to order at 635. Um, the meeting is being videotaped. Uh, just first, we'll just review the agenda. We've got minutes. Did you send us both? Yes. Okay, there, it's no. both the um, December and January. January minutes. I don't have mine, but I know here. Um, so we'll take a look at those. We've got our rep updates. We have our ED report with our new ED. And then we'll go through task force updates and then committee updates, except for climate and special ed because Rick and Allison are both out sick. Um, and then we will go into executive session where we're going to be talking about pending litigation and strategies for negotiating with represented and non-represented personnel. And we will come back out into open session. Okay. So, okay. All right, so with that, any changes to the agenda? Anything anyone wants to add? That's fine. <clears throat> All right, um, can we take a look at the minutes? Any questions? December ones in particular, look at the, um, because we only had two people look at those. There are no changes to the minutes, then I would entertain a motion to approve. Is this just the December minutes? December only? Yep. <laughs> I know, right? Usually. And just think one month we'll actually get these minutes out like in plenty of time when we don't have a whole bunch of other things going on. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Okay, if there are no comments, I will entertain a motion to approve the December minutes. A motion. <coughs> Lucy makes a motion. I second the motion. Tom seconds. All in favor? I'm sorry, just to be clear, are we doing both? December the only? December only, okay. Yep, December. All do in I, favor? Do I have to abstain? I wasn't there. No, so it doesn't matter. You can okay. vote. You can vote. <coughs> Um, motion passes unanimously. Or did you abstain? I was going to abstain, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Tom abstained. Tom T. And then we can look at the January minutes. Are there any comments or questions on the January minutes? 
Second. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve those. So moved. Chris Second. made the motion. Liz seconded. All in favor? Okay, January meeting minutes are approved as well. Thank you. Um, we'll go to public comment. We have three people. Sandy Mindersma. Jessica Bowen, please keep your comments short. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was your name? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'll try and keep it short, Pauline. Um, I, um, when I heard the news that Dr. Lewis had been uh, appointed um, to, as our acting ED, um, I posted something on the AMSA Facebook chat page, and it was extremely popular, I have to say, uh, not to stretch this out, Pauline, but it might be my most popular <laughs> post ever. <laughs> but um, I, I really um, feel it from the heart, and I thought it was worth putting it out in the public. I know not everybody is on Facebook, and I wanted the board to hear this, and um, Dr. Lewis as well. So um, on the page when the announcement came out, uh, people were saying, why didn't the board make Dr. Lewis the permanent ED? Um, so this is what I wrote. I've seen many people wondering on their posts why the board didn't appoint Dr. Lewis the permanent ED. I have no inside information on this, but I'm wondering if it wasn't the board who made that decision, but Dr. Lewis himself. We should take a minute to think about this from his point of view. He is someone who loves to teach. Um, <laughs> why would he trade a job that he loves for a job that he has seen chew up a parade of people? If we really want Dr. Lewis to be a successful long-term leader at AMSA, it is imperative that we support him. We need to demand less of ourselves, of, we need to demand less of him and more of ourselves. We need to support policies and decisions rather than squabbling about our own personal inconveniences. We need to obey rules and accept consequences for breaking these rules with grace. We need to volunteer for committees, for dances. We need to attend PTO meetings and board meetings. And we need to come together and show the board and Dr. Lewis how committed each one of us are to the success of this institution. And then maybe he will want to stay and lead us. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody would win. So as someone who has worked in the history department um, since my first day here, I was hired by Dr. Lewis. I am blessed to be part of this organization. I owe my career here at AMSA to him, and I can't think that there's a better choice, and I will do literally whatever you ask me <laughs> to, to make this work. Okay, from now on, we need tissues at the table. <laughs> Monique Brown. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Monique Brown, and I have a disclaimer. Uh, I'm a Dr. Lewis fan, too, as my son, Ian, class of 2016, had him as a homeroom teacher. So I have nothing but positive things to say, and I'm glowing. I'm very, very happy uh, to see that you have selected him as the interim ED. Um, but I'm here to talk about fame. Uh, FAME is the Friends of Art and Music Education at AMSA, which I am a proud member. and. Um, 
FAME is a registered charitable organization. It consists of a group of AMSA parents whose primary goals at this point in time are to one, advocate for expanded and better quality instrumental music programs at AMSA. Two, support all art and music teachers and events, especially arts nights, with fundraising and volunteer staffing. We believe that AMSA, an outstanding math and science school, deserves music programs on par with other quality math and science schools in the country. For example, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, which has 1,200 students to, to, to full-time music teachers. Um, their curriculum includes advanced orchestra, uh, philharmonic, uh, advanced orchestra, symphonic, AP music theory, symphonic band, um, symphonic wind ensemble, and regular band. Also on par with Bronx Science. Uh, which has uh, 3,000 students, four-time music teachers. Um, I won't list all of the classes, but the one closest to us is Abby Kelly. Um, their charter sa states that the mission of Abby Kelly Foster Charter Public is to assist parents in their role as primary educators of their children by providing a classical liberal arts education grounded in the great works of Western civilization and aimed at academic excellence, musical competence, and character formation. Their faculty includes five full-time middle and high school music teachers presenting two concerts per year as well as graduations and other events. We feel that music education is beneficial for all students, especially math and science students. This has been well studied, but we will highlight a few data points. One, the College Entrance Examination Board has found that students involved in music and music appreciation score 63% higher on verbal and 44 points higher in math than students with no arts participation. The U.S. Department of Education has shown that students who report consistently high levels of involvement in instrumental music during middle and high school show significantly higher levels of mathematics proficiency by grade 12. The former U.S. Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, wants to find in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that arts are core subjects and as such play a significant role in children's development and learning process. To these ends, we have been meeting regularly with AMS administrations since 2012. Initially, FAME members brought gifted 15-year veteran band teacher William Brisson on board to restart the AMSA Jazz Band. Now, it was understood that the band program would begin initially as a club and then become part of the school day's elective class offerings, just as chorus is now. Then principal Jay Sweeney was enthusiastic about starting a pep band to play at AMSA sports events in addition to a jazz band. Since then, administration support for instrumental music at AMSA has wavered and declined. Fame is now very deeply concerned about the school's commitment to instrumental music. The main issues we advocate for have not been resolved or addressed concretely. Moreover, Fame feels that it was misled by the former executive director. We wish to put two important questions to the Board of Trustees. Number one, why has no progress been made toward making some form of instrumental music a half credit elective? Number two, why has AMSA only hired one part-time retired teacher upon retirement of William Brisson? The current teacher is, we fear, not a good match for AMSA. We are very concerned about the current jazz band teacher, especially poor communication skills and lack of energy to expand the band. The current situation is especially frustrating since upon Mr. Brisson's resignation in June 2016, fame again brought a well-qualified, young, and enthusiastic teacher to the school. This candidate was offered an annual salary of $5,000, much lower than Mr. Brisson's salary. She had to refuse on financial grounds. This salary offer was also considerably lower than the $9,000 collected from parents' activity fees for jazz band. Accordingly, we are extremely concerned that instead of making a commitment to instrumental music, 
By hiring the good teacher our school deserves, AMSA made money from parents. Furthermore, in the charter, it is deemed a good hiring practice for art and music teachers to hold a master class before AMSA evaluators, and that's on page 38 of the charter. AMSA has no certified music teachers on staff, but some FAME members are certified music educators. These qualified practicing music professionals had hoped to conduct evaluations for the school and are still ready and willing to volunteer to do so. While FAME recognizes that jazz band is now a club and not yet a full class, good hiring protocols were not followed to the school's detriment. We believe a better decision could have been made and should have been made. 10% attrition of band members during the first month of the new teacher's tenure, failure to attract new members, and inability to expand performance opportunities and grow the band are factors we fear, fear will kill the program. Moreover, although music is specifically mentioned in the charter, the former executive director stated to FAME members that it is not. And because it is not, made no effort to accommodate instrumental music as more than a Tuesday afternoon club. We feel that AMSA deserves better. AMSA deserves a full instrumental music program, and FAME fully believes that this will happen. We can seize the opportunity now to make a strong program or let someone else take the reins in the future. We know that one way or another, with the help of this, this administration or another, instrumental music will be strong at AMSA, and our students will receive the benefit of a well-rounded education, as do students in other top math and science schools. We ask the Board of Trustees not just to assist in rectifying the mistakes of the past ED, but to help our students to achieve the very best they can in instrumental music. Specifically, we would like the AMS administration to, one, hire a two-thirds or full-time certified music teacher to teach instrumental music, instrumental ensemble music to all grades. Number two, hire this teacher using good protocols, specifically teaching a master class. FAME music teacher members are happy to assist this process. Number three, offer instrumental music ensemble as a half credit class during the school day like chorus. Number four, actively promote and grow the band by expanding performance opportunities for school functions. A growing music program needs a growing and energetic teacher. We hope AMSA will shortly hire a full-time certified instrumental music teacher of high ability and vision. It is what our children deserve. Respectfully submitted, fame. And I also have here, and I believe um, we have copies for everyone, I have a selected and annotated timeline of fame at AMSA that shows um, from June 2012, um, our interactions with administration through January 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You'll leave the with Sarah so that she can distribute for us. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's move on to the faculty representative update. Uh, hi. Um, <laughs> it would be hard to follow up on some of the things that have been said earlier uh, from, from different public speakers. Um, I'll just focus on the faculty's a reaction to events of the past couple of weeks. Um, first of all, the faculty wants me to relay, and I mean this sense of every department, every building, old or young faculty, they were asking me to relay their thanks to the board, uh, not only for the, um, the, the, the decisive integrity of its actions, but also for what may seem like a small gesture, such as having board members show up on that Tuesday where it was announced to the faculty, that um, the number of board members who came to directly 
you know, <coughs> to speak to or to at least share that moment with those who were here at AMSA uh, was something that touched people personally. It's not happened before. And they were very grateful for that. Um, they are uh, extraordinarily happy that someone that they know, know well and know well to, to love this school and to genuinely cherish its mission and knows how to engage with people in a way that sees them as colleagues, as, uh, as brothers and sisters in the same cause, rather than as uh, elements of a simple organization. The uh, reaction, I would say, is one of genuine optimism. Some people will qualify saying, well, I'll be cautious that this is AMSA and it has a history. <laughs> but uh, I heard no one speak in terms of pessimism or um, dismay or unhappiness. It was some of the new teachers were saying, well, I don't know what's going on, but maybe you can tell me. Um, and those who were more than a few months here were looking at the school and its future in a new way, a new light. And uh, they said, whatever you do, make sure that they, they the board, and everyone here today understands that it is something that they cherish and they value. Um, in terms of our own work, there's a realization that there's a lot of problems that we've inherited and need to fix so that next year uh, there's no need to be um, continuing unhappiness at problems that come from a schedule or um, different, uh, different ways that in administration interacts with faculty that were not necessarily for the best and that faculty realizes it has to now uh, prove itself. It has to stop um, just pointing out what needs to be fixed and start now that it has space for it to help be part of the solution. And the number of different people have come to me and said, I, what can I do to make a difference? Is there a committee I can join? Is there a group I can work with? Is there a particular area of AMSA that needs to have a resolution, a resolution fast, and maybe I have expertise for it? It's this uh, wishing to volunteer and be a part of it is something that I've never seen to this extent before at AMSA, ever. And uh, it's kind of heartwarming. It's also heartwarming to see that it's not just a core veteran group that is speaking this way, but many of the younger <coughs> teachers are also seeing this this way. Um, and so we're looking forward to hope. We know we're looking forward with hope to what comes ahead, but also the realization that we now actually have to take advantage of this opportunity to make the real difference for the school going forward. Um, and for the first time ever in my very short career here, I I was not told to convey any complaint whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Tom? Don't worry, this next month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll enjoy the moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Liz. Um, same thing, and actually I'll thank Jess and Sandy because you guys pretty much summed it up from what I've been hearing. Um, the biggest outstanding question or issue around everything that's transpired over the last few weeks is really the question around why is Dr. Lewis not a permanent replacement to which um, you know we've we've basically stated that there are no current plans to initiate a search but you know the board is going to be focused on the strategic plan over the next few months so that's really um, that sums it up for, for where we are right now. And um, I would say that the you have the overwhelming support of the parents from everything I've heard. I can't say it's 100% because I haven't talked to all of them, but <laughs> it's certainly overwhelming uh, positive support for you and your new world. So thank you for taking it on. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Liz? <clears throat> did you get any complaints? No, I did not. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> All right, so let's move on to our ED report. Okay, thank, thank you all very much. I uh, very much appreciate the support. So, um, sin sincerely, um, 
Last week I had the opportunity to <coughs> speak to the staff uh, for the first time and I just thought it would be useful to reiterate what I said uh, there um, since they uh, we went over kind of my <laughs> philosophy and um, just a couple really important goals and things that um, I think we're uh, going to be focusing on. Um, so forgive me, I have a prepared speech here. Uh, try not to be too boring, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that I hit all the basic points so uh, I can be clear. Um, I think above all else, a fundamental priority is to create a school and a community where every uh, excuse me, every uh, teacher, every administrator, every student, and every parent feels respected and listened to. Um, so I'm very much committed to doing that. And uh, we're going to be restarting the Executive Director Advisory Council uh, as a mechanism to provide feedback. And not one-way feedback, but two-way feedback. Um, I'm also very much committed to getting out of the office that is in the lower school. I, I think I referred to it as kryptonite um, <laughs> when we spoke to the staff. Um, I think it's just really important that everybody sees that there's the, the walls that have separated uh, teachers from administrators need to be torn down. And uh, everybody sees all of us as working as a team together towards a common goal. So I'm very much committed to doing that and to not being close to the kryptonite. Uh, it's also very important that we build a school that permits growth. Um, a school community where there's room to make mistakes, where teachers and administrators and everybody knows that it's okay to make a mistake because someone is going to get you back up off the floor um, and help you. Um, Tom has been incredibly helpful to me on so many levels and several uh, days ago we discussed what his vision of the school was and he mentioned how uh, he was interested <coughs> in creating a school of mutual enlightenment, a place not only where students learn and students create and <coughs> students explore, but a place where teachers and administrators create and administrators explore uh, and administrators try new <coughs> things. Um, so that very much is an important goal that I think we all share. Um, I know that I don't have the answers to many, many things. Uh, that's probably the, the one certain thing that I can say. Uh, but I do know that working collaboratively, working together as a team, that we do have the answers. We have absolutely, positively everything we need at this school to make this school the best school in the state, <coughs> the best school in the nation. We have amazing teachers. We have amazing administrators. We need to come together and work as a team. And if we do that, nothing is going to get in our way. So in terms of some of the commitments that I really, really want to focus on, one very, very important commitment that I mentioned when we met last week is teacher retention. And I want to be very, very clear, teacher turnover is not good. It's not good for the morale of teachers. It is not good for our students. We need to dedicate ourselves to making sure that the teachers that we have feel respected, that they feel that this is a place that they can grow, and that this is a place that they wish to stay. We want to be known as a school, not that bleeds teachers out, but that attracts teachers here. Secondly, uh, as, and all of these goals are interrelated, um, to help keep teachers, it's very important that we have a terrific schedule in place. And, the schedule has been one of the more difficult issues that all of us, particularly the teachers, had to confront this year. Um, so we are going to um, bend heaven and earth uh, to make sure that we have a fantastic schedule in place. Um, and to do that, we're clearing away a lot of the obstacles that have been put into place. Um, we're moving to an eight-day rotation from a six-day rotation. We're removing the fixed department period from the schedule. Uh, and we're going to go back to what we did <coughs> for uh, many, many years, which was mixing lower school students with upper school students. Uh, that is 
going to have a very big role to uh, help us create the schedule that we need to have. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of an update, we've already begun the process of establishing a timeline for completing the schedule, for getting a draft of the schedule into teachers' hands. We've set a goal of June 1st as the time, and you can hang my head and hold me to that. I'm perfectly happy to have that happen, June 1st. Um, and what I'm most excited about is the fact that we have an in-house team of people such as Padmaja over there who are top-notch experts in how to build programs, how to run programs, and Ellen, thank you. Um, just an absolutely first-rate group of people who uh, I have no doubt will be able to accomplish this goal and produce a great schedule. And also, what really excites me about the team that we've already brought together is I think it could be an example of what we can do at AMSA if we work together. If teachers and administrators work together towards a common goal, and this is such an important common goal, the schedule is our spinal cord. And we can show right now, right off the bat in the next few months, we can show through struggle, through difficulty, that we can do something very, very valuable and we can do it together as comrades, as colleagues. Uh, the third important goal that I have, we have, is uh, making AMSA a place of growth for teachers and that means that we need to change professional development at AMSA. We've had over the past year and a half or so a policy that permitted teachers one day of professional development each year. Uh, during the school year, and that didn't work. Uh, teachers need uh, opportunities to explore the content, to explore pedagogy, to grow and to learn, to ignite their passion and the love of the content that they teach. So we're going to talk to teachers, we're going to survey teachers, we're going to reach out to the entire community and ask what is the PD program that we can create that gives teachers that opportunity so that they feel that AMSA is a place where they can grow and learn, not just for a few months, but for five years, for 10 years, for, t for 20 years. This is a place that is their home where they can teach. Last but not least, just um, what is my philosophy of education? I, I just have a fairly simple philosophy, and, and it's really summed up in the phrase high expectations. Um, each and every single child who comes, uh, each and every single child who comes to our school can learn. Uh, each and every single child, um, regardless of what zip code uh, they live in, regardless of their ability, can succeed their expectations and can succeed our expectations. And all of us are committed to creating a school where that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly from the board's perspective, you have our full support. Um, we are very committed to ensuring that um, we can contribute to the success of the school however possible as well. So you know that you can count on all of us um, in any way that you need Colleen, help can I ask as well. one question? Sure. Uh, just because you brought up the um, advisory council, are you going to continue with the coffees as well? Uh, absolutely, yes. Okay. Any, right. Anything I can do to reach <laughs> okay. out and talk. All right. Yes. Maybe we, yes. we can work on that would be great. getting that scheduled for, for March. So That would be great. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank you. Um, okay, so we're moving on to chair so business. So I, I have one okay. question. So, uh, so I had a couple of parents ask about uniform policy, and they were just, uh, they were, they were. This is uh, not a test, by the way. <laughs> The old, the old softies now, the ED, so. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I think it was more uh, in the, the, there was a general sense that there's been a lot of churn in the uniform policy, um, you know, particularly over the last year. A great many parents have gone to expense to, to conform with the uniform policy. And, you know, there was sort of, you know, there were questions about is that going to continue? Is it going to go in a new direction? Um, well, and so forth. And I'm not looking so much for an answer now. 
um, because you may not have considered you probably have other things that are on your mind but I would encourage you to try to clarify yes uh, well, that issue. Uh, we have our terrific dean of students in the lower school Ben Keeler who is here and uh, Mr. Naraki who is not here uh, Ben and Mike have already worked on with Ellen as well uh, some and really I think useful important clarifications to the uniform policy that I think will be most useful to parents and to uh, students um, they know much more about it than I do but they have worked very very hard they know the uniform and, and the concerns that parents and, and, and um, students have and uh, I, I have full confidence that they will be able to put forth a policy that will solve many of the issues that have come up Thank you. So see, that was a good test, right? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so moving on to chair business. Actually, the, as the first order of business, I, I want to uh, thank someone who has helped the board a great deal, and he may not realize how much he has helped. About four years ago, three years ago, there was quite a lot of turmoil at the school. Um, I know there has been <coughs> during that whole time as well. But at that time in particular, there was um, a great deal of mistrust of the board in general and um, one person started coming to our board meetings and videotaping them and putting them out um, for public consumption on his own time entirely uh, volunteering and he's come to basically every single board meeting in the in, in the intervening three years and it's been so helpful from the board's perspective to um, make make what we do transparent and to have it out for the community to be able to see what it is that the board is actually trying to do listen to our debates the <coughs> things that we think about and the considerations of the decisions that are made and so um, I did want to publicly acknowledge now we have Mike Finkel on board who's you know a member of the staff who will be doing this going forward but I did absolutely want to publicly acknowledge Stan Macasio, can you please come up? Because we really want to thank you. For this is incredible. Uh, Okay. We are just all in happy boots today, aren't we? It's good. All right, let's move on to the tough stuff. Okay, the business of the business. Um, task force updates. We have a strategic planning task force. And we've Chris. been unable to meet. Okay, that's Stay not a surprise. Um, quick update, we appreciate that. That was a very yeah. quick update. <laughs> Um, I just want to make a note here that the strategic planning up uh, task force is something that we agreed after the uh, January planning meeting um, to put together this group to talk about what the mission is. We talked about a little bit more in governance to get a little more clarity at the next level down. Um, I haven't talked to you about this, but <laughs> it's just, probably we would want the ED to be part of it, at least, you know, in, in bits and pieces, maybe not at every single meeting, but at least in mm -hmm. key um, time frames uh, as you move forward. The other thing that we want to talk about is um, the idea of scheduling a, another strategic planning session to go through this. Um, we raised this in January, whether people were willing to devote part of a Saturday morning in March. Um, I have not had the opportunity yet to send around a doodle poll, but I am going to do that. And I just want to make sure put that on everyone's radar screen that we are going to try to schedule that if we can't do it in March we'll do it in April but we'll try to work towards having another dedicated five or six hours of time so appreciate it think that'll be facilitated again or? we will ask Marcy to come back so we can have it facilitated yep yeah I think that was very helpful yeah I mean unless people felt otherwise okay okay regional issues Ken so um, <clears throat> not a whole lot to update um, you may recall from previous meeting uh, I talked about um, that we had developed a list of issues for the school's consideration this was you know basically a next step um, that we that uh, we felt could be taken uh, given the the fact that um, 
the task force had gotten to a point of, 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 of asking for but not getting participation by the administration and staff in this. And so at that point, it was felt that the only, you know, course left was to, you know, put together this list. Um, in light, and so as a result, also recognize that many of these things um, were things that the school might be able to take on now that we've recognized and articulated the issues uh, to go ahead and, and forward them to the school because the school's uh, administration was going to have to be largely responsible for implementing that, certainly not the board. Um, <clears throat> I think at, at this point, given sort of where we are and so, uh, so far, I'd like to re-engage at some point. Uh, with Dr. Lewis to see if that's sort of the best course still or whether we might want to step back and, and take a new look at the task force. So that's sort of where we are right now. Do we continue to go in light of all the things that are going on in the school right now, maybe just continuing down the path of articulating the, um, uh, the, the issues that uh, the regional issues task force come up with uh, or maybe try to re-engage with a, a, another, you know, as, sort of a, a broader study that would include members of the administration uh, and staff, uh, faculty rather. So that's where, that's what I have to report. So it probably makes sense to re-engage with the administration at least initially, right? And then see. So I agree. Uh, and, you know, I think on some level there's a lot of things that are going to Cry out for attention. So yeah. I just I, I want to acknowledge, yeah, okay. acknowledge okay. that uh, in all the priorities, uh, you know, certainly, you know, teacher retention, the schedule, and so forth, the uh, professional development, the things that Dr. Lewis already <laughs> talked about, are probably, you know, bigger priorities to sort of make sure that we make progress on. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we'll go move on to committee updates, governance first. Okay, so what each of you should have a hard copy of, I don't know, Tom, yeah. a hard copy of is a um, uh, sort of a proposal with regards to uh, really sort of communication, improving board communication and alignment with the administration. And this really um, started out of a conversation we had in, in a recent executive session where we said, we really, as a board, need to have more insight um, into, one, um, some of our ad administrative hires, um, being able to be a resource from the standpoint of providing input, uh, advice relative to some of the hiring positions that, that we make. And so as a board, and we have pretty good representation, actually I think it was the first time we had 100% participation of the um, board, and our remote policy has certainly helped that. In addition, we had um, Ms. Bandero, um, Ben Keeler, Tom, of course, who's on the uh, governance <coughs> committee. And so we looked at it from a bit more of a holistic standpoint and said, really, we want better insight. And one of the areas that that will come from is if we have better communication and better alignment with the administration and the faculty. And that very first one up there, because we didn't want to look at it from the perspective of um, administration because the board is really about governance and we don't want to fall into the line of sort of managing or micromanaging. So we talked about that for a while and what was uh, recommended, and I think it was actually Pauline's suggestion, was that we have both the principal and the business manager as ex officio um, members of the board, which at that point would give us the ability, in addition to the um, ED who's already an ex officio, but be able to have greater alignment, input here directly from uh, the business manager and the, uh, the principal relative to things that the board is interested in, what's happening at the school, and that would give us sort of that closeness that previously most of our communication and information has come from the ED. So we're looking to expand upon that. So what you see there under number one is a recommendation to the board that we revise the bylaws to add those two positions as ex officio, and if the board then agrees with that, prior to the next meeting, Sarah would be drafting and agree to draft language um, for the to revise the bylaws, and then at the next meeting we would come and take a vote um, on the revised language of the bylaws to add those two uh, members to the um, as ex officio. 
to the board. So, and feel free, anybody who is uh, any of so the other committee we, members. We would vote in April in. or in May? Uh, I was actually March. thinking we would vote March. in March. March. March, I'm sorry. Yeah. I yeah. lost a month. Yeah. In March. So in March. we vote at our, at our next meeting. Right. Okay. Yeah, but we should yeah. discuss it here. I mean, this is a pretty right. controversial proposal. <laughs> yeah. And it was pretty controversial when we talked about it in governance, mm -hmm. too. So I like reactions. Can you Can you help so. me understand a little bit about why, why is it controversial? Well, and I think just from the standpoint, we need to have disapprove it, um, assuming they would. Um, What's the real downside? I think the, the, the wrestling match, the, the wrestling that we had to do with it was, you know, are we getting involved in management? And it was a long conversation about, you know, do we want to, you know, have input into hires? Well, we can't do that. That's not governance. And this was a way that we thought and actually, and it was Pauline's insight that it, it's routine in corporations that mm -hmm. the top three officers are ex officio members of the board. They don't vote, but that gives us the visibility that we need that we lack so badly <laughs> in the past. And without them having, you know, we're not we're not managing them, we're not directing them. We're not hiring not and firing. They're not reporting to us. Yeah. We're not hiring and firing them, but they are part of the conversation. And as part of the conversation, we can know them, we can know what's going on, yeah. we can observe the interaction uh, and form a more, and, and, and therefore do a better job at what is our job, which is supervising. Yeah, you know, one way, one way to, to clarify this issue of governance versus operations would be in, in the same way that there is a, a, a description of the job for the executive director in terms of that governance role, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't talk in the bylaws about all the duties that, that, uh, that the executive director would have, but it does talk about it in terms of a governance way. You could do the same thing with the principal and, and business manager in terms of their role in, in, in supporting the board's governance. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, so, you know, for example, you know, you could sit there and talk about uh, organizational viability as one of the three things, or one of the three governance responsibilities that we have. Part of organizational viability is the financial aspects of, uh, of the health of the school. And so therefore, talking in general terms about that governance role, you could do that. And, and therefore, uh, for someone who had a question about, well, why are they an ex officio member, you sit there and say, here is the governance role that the principal mm -hmm. plays, yep. Yep. That, the, um, that the business manager plays, uh, yep. that is, is it apart from their management role, management duties, and so forth. Yep. So that mm -hmm. might serve to clarify Well, that. they're definitely compliance-related mm -hmm. um, aspects of their job, right, <laughs> which is governance. So. Is well, so, uh, you know, yeah. okay, so I, yeah. I feel strongly, as I've expressed in the past, that, um, that while the executive director is our main interface, in carrying out our governance role, all the weight of that, those governance responsibilities don't just rest on the ED's shoulders. You take the principal out. You take the business manager out. You know there there are certain positions that, if if they are not operating well, if we haven't hired solid people into those positions, and I'm speaking in a general theoretical sense, not about the specific people that we have. I'm saying in a general sense, over the longer term, if we don't always have good people uh, in those positions, then we're not going to be able to carry out those governance roles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ED won't be able to carry out his management, his or her management roles either. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's for the ED to 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 determine. I think it's well within our governance responsibilities to insist that that you know they have a role in governance as well. So I, th I think there's a great solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I think I disagree. I think. Um, I think we have the opportunity to interact with the principal um, through the education committee. We have the opportunity to interact with the business manager through the finance committee. Mm -hmm. I think it's unnecessary for them to be um, on the full board. I think we're reacting to a feeling that we were getting filtered information or something like that, and 
if that's the case i think we have a responsibility to um you know question the executive director at that point in time and take action if it's necessary but i i think we're presupposing um that that there's there's a problem in communication and that the, these people should be here and, and i think that's premature i i, th I find it s surprising mm -hmm. that someone who has been on the board as long as you uh, are have been would are would describe that as presupposing given the history that we have had and we're putting the history behind us and moving forward at this point in time and i think that this is a solution to a problem that I don't believe exists at this point in time and further I believe we have mechanisms to get feedback from these people already and as we have consistently talked about trying to push down a lot of the business of the board to the subcommittees uh, to the committees that's that's where I believe the interaction belongs that's that's my opinion yeah, obviously you have a different one um, I don't sure it's up to rep if I'm really uh, Am I allowed to speak openly about this? Mm -hmm. It's my employer. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand what Tom Tavern is saying, except I have lost confidence that the continued, you know, the history of these problems we've had through time, um, I do not believe they're just the, happy ac the unhappy accident of particular characters. I believe there is a structural component. Uh, we seem to put an awful lot of weight, the way things are currently structured, on relying on the word of one person. Um, then, yes, you can eventually surmise that there is an issue with that. Then you can eventually react, and it's been consistently lagging, slow. Problems are made real before we start to solve them. Would it be that hard to have slight changes in structure, such as having principal and business manager um, be able to be communicated directly by the board? Uh, is that such a major change, uh, given the, uh, the reward, that it might save a huge amount of time in recognizing issues that do need to be addressed, and to actually have an answer where we are <laughs> proactively solving problems before they become serious and damaging. How many times can we have the horse be lame before we have to say, do we shoot it? <laughs> or do we find a way to salvage it? How about as soon as it starts to be a bit hobbled, saying, hmm, okay, let's nip things in the bud. Uh, insight information can be enhanced by moves such as this. Um, I guess I'm not seeing the downside, given the obvious downside of not doing things like this in the past. <coughs> So, Can we, yeah, I just say if others weigh in, Mike, Liz, Lucy. So, I've switched sides on this. So, originally, when we, I remember we first started talking about it, I was very <laughs> supportive of it. I, I'm really more in Tom's camp right now. I, I think that um, I feel like we're late to the dance on this mm -hmm. one. You know that that this is something that because we did not have we did not have this in place that we were really restricted. We were really handy handcuffed, and so. Um, the question that I want to ask is, could we, is there a way to, to create the cap pass some type of a, get approval to be able to do this so we have it in our back pocket and we can just invoke it if something, if we wake up one day and uh, Dr. Lewis is not in that role or we find, whatever happens, we find ourselves in a tricky situation that we can invoke this policy that we actually have already solicited, we have this approved and it's mm -hmm. available to us mm -hmm. in our back pocket. That's, that's something that's kind of interesting to me. I would, mm -hmm. I'd be very supportive of that um, because I think it's something that was not available to us. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But I have no interest, need, desire to, you know, put us into this type of mode right now. I don't think we need to do it. I feel like Dr. Luce is telegraphing very specific messages to us around transparency and openness. Um, I feel like the problems that this was intended, among but the problems we were trying to address, I think have gone away. But I'd like to have the authority to, to say that we have approval and that we can do that should something change down the road. So just to be clear, the bylaws, um, 
I mean, they are what they are, but we also have things in the bylaws that we don't use. Like right now, we do have in there the idea of, of there's a vacancy with the executive director of development who reports directly to the board, and that's 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 in the bylaws. And obviously, we don't have that person. <coughs> I mean, I, I like so, having that. I like having this toolbox of capabilities that are available to us when we need them, as opposed to inserting something that I'm just not sure it feels like another layer of mm -hmm. management <coughs> oversight. I mean, it's interesting. Tom's point was not something that was discussed in governance. Yeah. We did not yeah. I, so that. I, I would say, so I would say no to this, but yes to getting it approved so we have it available to us. Mm -hmm. Part of my concern about having this sort of as an optional thing is uh, by the time we have to have something, we find a need to have this, this uh, channel of communications and we have to invoke this channel communications, we've gone way down a path here. And I think history now has shown that having multiple views, the board in its governance role, having multiple uh, channels into the health of the school, it would have been a useful thing. And I think that this puts that in place. And I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I think Tom articulated best. What's the downside of doing this? If we find, if we find that if, you know that this is somehow resulting in greater uh, board interference in the management of it, then I think we you can address that by clarifying through the bylaws that this ex officio capacity <coughs> is really for a governance role, not management. Just thinking out loud, um, another possible alternative might be to leave it to the discretion of the chair to extend an invite to those um, two particular positions, depending on the topic that's going to be discussed at that time, or if there's an interest in getting some additional or broader input beyond the ED, True. Yep. Um, and just have it on almost an invite-only basis as mm -hmm. opposed to making it a permanent change. Yep. Also, my question would be, um, is the business manager um, a dedicated member of the finance committee? Yes. yes. Okay. And the principal is a dedicated member of the ed committee. Of the ed committee. Yeah, so they are. Well, so um, that would and be, that, that is, has been the practice at times in the past, and there have been other times when that dedicated aspect has been interfered with so okay so yeah. we need to make sure that that is a dedicated that they are dedicated members i mean that, that well, maybe be, that's the bylaw change yeah. i mean yeah. make the bylaw change to put those two positions in okay. those committees yeah. i mean the committee mm -hmm. piece could be worded <clears throat> yeah mm -hmm. that was my thought the, my other question would be and maybe we ask marcy this what do other charter schools look like do they i mean do their boards so the best practice is not to have any faculty okay. or staff or parent reps, frankly, yeah. <laughs> on, on the, okay. we have always, Tom. yeah, that, that has always been right. the best practice yeah. because the idea, best practice governance is that people yeah. are not representing stakeholders. Right. right. And so we have always chosen not to do that, obviously, and we thought, thought it was important to have those voices represented. Um, there are other charter schools that do have different structures, like they, I mean, is it Parker that has just a certain number of faculty who can actually be on the board? Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure McAuliffe has their CFO as a member of the board, um, right? Yeah, so, they, 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 I mean, different charter schools yeah. do do, do it different okay. ways. Yeah. You know, I'm approaching it from a, um, um, from a new position on the board. Clearly, I've only been on the board for a few months, but I, I can't see the problem with it. I agree with Ken and with uh, Tom. I think uh, the more communication, the better. Like Dr. Lewis is trying to break down the walls that was between administration and the faculty. The more we break it down, the better. That doesn't mean we have to get involved in the administrative decisions of the school. But I think the more communication, uh, the better off we're going to be. Even if we don't think there's a problem right now, I just can't see what the pro I don't see the downside at all. So I um, respect what Tom and Mike are saying. And I do see the, t the temptation to get more involved than we should in the school. And I think that is something that we would need to be vigilant about but 
I also do think that it's that's a relatively small risk, and it's something that we can um, we can deal with it. You know, we have to be conscientious, but we can we can deal with that. And it's just that you know things. The, the history is so bad, and it's you know we're. I just think that the, that 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 amount of visibility into actually being able to observe how those relationships are working in a room would help us tremendously in finding, in, in, in reacting in a more timely way when, <coughs> when we're required to, required to intervene. I already said that too, but. I, I would, you know, if we do go forward with this in, in whatever capacity that we do it, whether it's members of the board, members of the committee, what have you, I think uh, a, a more detailed description of their governance role and carrying that ex officio role out um, would be helpful and yeah. clarifying for all concerned yeah. that this is a governance right. activity, not, in, in, you know, in terms of, you know, again, the three things that we're responsible for, academic program success, faithfulness to the charter, organizational viability. Um, that's their their role in this ex officio uh, as ex officio members of the board uh, would be to to support that governance role mm -hmm. different sure. idea is mm -hmm. we could also require their attendance but not put them on the board mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm trying to see yep, what that's impossible. sort of the difference in the objective would be. We wouldn't have to go through having the bylaws changed. Um, the end result would still be the same. Right? We'd have them in attendance. Mm -hmm. But can point? they speak if they're not on the board? No. Yeah, no. They can only they actually if asked. speak and participate? Only if asked. Yeah, only right. if asked. That's a good question. As, as which, yeah. There's no. a reason why we have a faculty rep, okay, and that faculty rep is a member of the board, as opposed to just somebody who we ask to attend, because being on the board lends a certain gravitas to the faculty representative role that would not be there without that. Okay, I just happen to feel the same thing is true <coughs> for the principal and business manager. Yeah, so I was forgetting the rules that we operate under as a school. Yeah, yeah I was just mm -hmm. thinking they can't a regular, a regular yeah. organization. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah Sarah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Sarah, you can add. Yeah, I just wanted to tell you that in 2015, uh, 2015 uh, in November, we actually oh, yep. made a request uh, with an amendment mm -hmm. where Dr. Cleary, the role of ED and EDD were removed as ex officio members. So they are not members. And so you, if you're going to That's do right. something like this, you're going to have to put the, them to back in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we really? have to reinstate. You're going to have to put them in. Anyway, and it's a quick turnover. But that's something to, we could do all at the same time. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, true. I'm glad you that's said that. Point. I was thinking. Of. That's right. Sarah sent that this this afternoon. Okay. So so we're not taking a vote yeah, today. Yeah, I suggest we, we kick it back to governance. I, I would say we kick this back to governance to discuss because yeah. the you know we didn't consider the idea of having them like designated on the committees yeah that, that is worth it I mean Allison and Rick were very involved in that discussion and they can't be here today so right. um, yep I think it'd be I useful to have their voices as well yeah was it unit was the governance committee unanimous and supportive of this it's unfinished yeah time we yeah but we didn't think about every you know um, I'm going to move rather quickly through the next yep. three so I don't use up too much time here. Um, but what you see on the, up on the screen was really collective input. I forgot to mention Jess Bowen also joined us too. And so again, under this sort of uh, heading of taking a holistic approach for improved communications and alignment, um, that number two up there, we talked a little bit about sort of having a cultural philosophy relative uh, about AMSA um, to make sure that we've got alignment with our leadership and the board. And as we began to talk about that from the standpoint of sort of values, respect, um, those types of, uh, uh, that type of kind of criteria. And as we talked about it, um, Chris then pulled up the statement of guiding principles 
which uh, we actually began working on, I think, almost a year ago or so, um, which is probably about 80% complete. And as he read through that, he said, boy, that sounds like a lot of the kinds of things that we're talking about to make sure when you think of AMSA, you know, th this is the kind of school that we all should, that every, everyone should be on the same page relative philosophically on when we think about AMSA, here's what we think about, being able to have open communication being able to respect one of those. A lot of the things, Dr. Lewis, that, that you mentioned earlier. Um, so Collaboration, that, innovation, right? Innovation, like that, yeah. yep, yep. So out of that, um, we evolved to the point of pretty much saying that the uh, task force that came out of the uh, strategic offsite that we had, which is really uh, Liz, Chris, Lucy, um, Tom. and Tom. Um, yeah, and Tom. Anderson. <laughs> we, you, I don't know if you know this yet, Andrews, but <laughs> <laughs> talked about adding your, uh, yourself there too. But we would take sort of the uh, this guiding principles document and sort of roll that into the work that the task force is doing in preparation for our next strategy offsite session, which was focused a lot on the mission, but it really would evolve to sort of one document. And part of the thought around that was also was something that we could actually sort of post up around the school, potentially. Say, this is what AMPS is about. This is our cultural philosophy. So that's where we ended on that one. Um, the second, third one there, which was sort of stakeholder engagement, which was really a um, conversation with regards to how do we as a board get better connected with key stakeholders in the school. And one of the ways we talked about doing that was extending an invite for those stakeholders to come into the board and actually, um, and initially we talked about department chairs and there are other stakeholder groups too, but let's say having those different stakeholder groups come to the board and because we didn't want to be burdensome with asking department chairs necessarily to do a presentation uh, to the board, but maybe just having sort of having a standard set of questions that we would ask. And so what you see up there are some of the questions that we quickly came up with just to sort of frame trying to get a sense of from that department chair or that key stakeholder. And there may be other things that, you know, we think about asking too. But this would be just sort of the frame, you know, what do you take pride in at AMSA? Where, where do you find the most joy, whether it's in your work or in the school? Um, if you thought about where you're at today and then you look two, three, four years down the road, um, what would you see differently? What do you envision um, that would be better about what you're doing here at AMSA or in your classroom that doesn't exist today? And then are there any obstacles that you think currently are standing in your path? So that's what we sort of talked about there. And then that last one, board oh, And just, just to add in, the idea was really all stakeholders. So, you know, it wasn't just academic department chairs, but, you know, maybe student government, um, the PTO, mm -hmm. um, the, the guidance, you know, mm -hmm. same. <laughs> yeah, and to um, deliberately, the yeah. idea of using these questions, and it could be these or they could be different, is instead of the kind of dog and pony show presentation that we're accustomed to, all right, guidance comes in, she stands there, she reads us some charts, we ask her some questions, she goes away. Uh, that's really not what's important. What's important is that there's a relationship forming, there's a discussion happening, and it, it, it lets us, again, be better informed. We have one more touch point with Great. Yep, a little bit better alignment. Yep. And then that last one there, um, relative to actually having board members sort of experience, you know, the AMPS experience in a classroom. And I think, Mike, your name was mentioned as having done that. <laughs> it's <longer>. amazing. <laughs> it is. It's just the great, I got to see uh, Tom in action, the pageant one, and it's just, it's really something. And, you know, you end up in conversations in the hallway with students. And mm -hmm. so uh, I loved it. So what what's the the purpose of the policy? I guess I'm not understanding. So uh, the discussion. I mean, it's not allowing it to happen because there's no prohibition on that now, is there? No, no I, it's I, I, is there an expectation of board members that they will making it more of a routine. Mm -hmm. No, no, actually, more the guardrails around it, oh, like yeah, what yeah. what you're yeah. you're not you're not there to 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 comment on the yeah, teachers. We're not <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Evaluate, we're not critique evaluate, or anything. Right. You're not like evaluating. That, no. you're not, yeah. Right. We don't want to create a threatening environment. Right. Yeah. This is one of engagement. And yeah. Alignment. And so, so myself and Roger uh, Jarrett were the two who uh, signed up for that one. And I know Roger's already sent around a bunch of links, I think, maybe some other schools yeah. and yeah, practices. Yeah. So we'll be working on that. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Yep. So that's about it. Um, 
and that was primarily probably 90 percent of our government spending. Good work. Thanks. Teamwork. Great. Thank you. Um, Ed Committee. So the Education Committee uh, met on January 12th uh, in sort of anticipation and preparation for the uh, the board's uh, strategic uh, planning meeting at the end of January. So we discussed uh, various ways to engage with the uh, the board in um, in its, uh, supporting its responsibilities in academic program success and faithfulness to charter. So it was a good discussion. Um, we've also uh, uh, have since kicked off the uh, um, the self-assessment uh, board doing uh, excuse me the committee ed education committee doing a self-assessment. So uh, Liz uh, put together a survey monkey survey that got sent out to the uh, members of the committee uh, to complete and we'll be putting those results together and then evaluating that as part of uh, as the committee um, and then we didn't meet on February 9th that already canceled the meeting because it was in the evening it ended up being sort of uh, it was going to get canceled anyway because school was out that day um, so but uh, we had canceled that and then uh, because of the vacations and the board uh, meeting schedule and so forth. We're just going to meet our regular next meeting would be our regular meeting date on March 9th And that's all I have Okay, great. And then finance and audit. Yep, so uh, we were scheduled to meet on Monday and because of the weather we did not meet on, on <laughs> Monday uh, We're gonna set up a meeting in March um, but we, have we do have we do have financials that if we did not have an opportunity to go through um, on Monday so I'm not going to go through those in oh, detail okay. at this point in time um, we're also in the budget process at this point in time it is possible uh, that we will be discussing the 2000 and fiscal year 2018 budget um, at our March Finance Committee meeting and at the March board meeting um, at the very latest we'll be discussing that at our April meeting so mm -hmm. we're moving forward on that but obviously um, there's other priorities out there and lots of moving pieces right now so uh, working our way through that so if anyone has questions on these financials ask Tom separately and fundraising and development so we've been sort of on hiatus since the reunion yep. um, and I do think it's time to pick it up again because we had, and we did have this conversation, uh, Maureen Evans and I with Dr. McCleary um, last month, is that we had, so back in, I think it was October, uh, when we discussed it, we said, well, what, what, what's our philosophy of having a surplus? What do we want to do with it? What do we want to do with the money? Let's get that squared away before we mount the annual campaign. So lots has happened since then and this whole strategic discussion also has bearing on that we do need to make some decisions if we want to do an annual campaign this year we really should start it by April yeah so you know we could you know, we, we, we could have the financial discussion at the March meeting but I think by the March meeting we've got to be ready to go ahead um, and then we can reactivate the committee and we can do the do the campaign in April to June time frame we had originally been trying to work it back you know we over time we drifted into the spring we're trying to work it back into the fall is a more natural time to have it but that's a that's a very secondary consideration I think given can you remind me why that is why is why is the fall better than the spring traditional tax planning season just yeah tax really addressing, is addressing, is. addressing up yeah. your taxes you ask for the money in yeah. December yeah. I think ideally we were thinking people are in a Christmas giving something mood. to be you know something to be thankful for around the Thanksgiving time frame is the wonderful experience your students have here at HAMSA <laughs> and oh by the way don't forget the tax consideration people people give in the fall for reasons of time I know there's two but this is the too many people saving up for ski vacations this time of year so well I think we do need to kick off an annual yeah. giving campaign for sure right we need to have yeah. one during the school year um, do, do we do it without this this discussion on on the reserves I think we're in such a different place now than exactly right? that <laughs> that is that, like yeah. I'm not having trouble thinking of a theme <laughs> <laughs> okay you know, 
I think the atmosphere is one that would support yeah. <laughs> and that the campaign could actually be a right. celebration of right. the new day. Yeah. Renewal. Have posters with Dr. Lewis around the school, put a dollar <laughs> bill on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people could have some fun with this. <laughs> um, so if that's a sense of the then let's go. <laughs> <laughs> dunk tanks are very popular. No, I'll do a dunk. Okay. I'll do that. <clears throat> I, I, I would just add that we did, you know, we did budget for forty thousand dollars. Yeah. That we're looking for, There's that um, too. Yeah. In the annual giving. Yeah. yeah. If we don't raise that, we're gonna, we're going to be fine for this year. But that that was what the expectation was yeah. based on previous I, years. I think we need to get into the habit. Okay. Okay. So with that, we can go into executive session. Well, is there any other business for open session? Uh, are you taking agenda items for next meeting sure. or two? I'll take agenda items. For no, I just meeting. I was uh, just getting clarification. Tom, I guess is. I, good. I think there's a potential. I mean, that, our protocol says we get agenda topics, so I'm get, glad Ken okay. know, reminded us of that. Yeah. I'd say we potentially are going to have the budget to discuss in March. Okay. I will let you know better in about two weeks' time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other agenda topics? We want clarification of the, the budget was the question. No, no, I was oh. just, uh, I was just, uh, it, for the rest of the board to understand that bu it's budget time coming up and yeah. that, um, that the March meeting or whenever it is that we're ready, we need to have all, all hands I on I encourage deck. people to come to any finance committee meeting because there are loads of fun. Um, <laughs> if, in fact, the March finance committee meeting is the review of the budget, that, that will be in the public notice and it'll be a long meeting. Um, but that would be a good one to will come. Will we receive advance notice? You will receive advance notice if we're going over the budget at the March meeting. Okay, thank you. If we're not, we're going to be dealing with it. In I mean, advance notice of the committee meeting. Yes. Thank you. Is there a, is it a meeting scheduled for March? It already? hasn't been scheduled yet, okay, but it's right. tentatively looking like March 13th. Okay, okay. All right. 13th. 13th. 13th, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I said that with confidence. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, I, I was just uh, amazed that, that Pauline was actually asking about whether the meeting had been scheduled, and it's just February. <laughs> March 13th, tentatively. Tentatively, there you go. You've got a tentative date. All right. All right, well then, it, um, if there's no other specific agenda items, um, we can, we'll go into executive session. I will entertain a motion. So moved. I didn't even finish speaking. <laughs> to discuss pending litigation and strategies for negotiation with, with represented and non-represented personnel. In that case, no. Still so moved. <laughs> okay. Second. Second. Okay, we need to do a roll call vote. Aye. Aye. Who's second? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Yes. Aye. Yes. Yes. All right. There we go. We're going in. We are coming back out in open session, but I don't know how long it's going to be. And the other thing is, I just forgot to mention, we're also inviting Dr. Lewis in. Yes. Um, I'm allowed not only for part of that. You are allowed for part of And yes, Thomas is allowed for part of it. Yeah. 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 Y